Morning, everyone. Welcome you to our first service this morning. Order of service is printed for you in the service folder. Quite a bit of information in there this week. Um, we'll be um, taking a, a quick look at a couple of the highlights at the end of the service. Our opening hymn is hymn 390, Jesus Take Us to the Mountain, hymn 390. And may God bless our time in his word. Please stand. We continue this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we remember that before the suffering and death of God's one and only Son, he revealed his glory on the holy mountain. May we who bear his cross on earth also behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory, and so be changed into his likeness, shining with grace and truth. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, 
Our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We live now in his peace. Rise each new day to serve him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 514, You Are the Way Through You Alone. Our first scripture lesson for this week in which we mark the transfiguration of our Lord comes to us from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 24, beginning at verse 12 and then continuing with verses 15 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here and I will give you the tables of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud. As he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for today comes to us from First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. The apostle writes, "For we do not follow cleverly devised stories." When we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
This again is the word of the Lord. Having heard the word which brings faith, we now join in confessing that faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. It begins on the bottom of page five in your service folder. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 389. Hymn 389. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of that Christ who one more time reveals himself in glory before walking resolutely to the cross. Our text for today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. 
After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So far, God's Word. When we think of light... When we think of the light of the gospel, the light of Christ, the light of God, the light of his word, I think most of the time Christians probably have a a mental image kind of akin to this, a light that is is, is comforting, reassuring, encouraging, Uh, this is the, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path kind of light. And and that's all true. And it is. The the light of God's word is a comforting thing, a reassuring thing, an encouraging thing. But when we talk about the light of God and the light of God's voice or the light of God's word in the Bible, uh, there are moments like this too. Like the transfiguration Uh, This particular painting is is from the Renaissance master, Raphael. His his particular painting here doesn't show, I I don't think, at least to human eyes, a particularly terrifying Jesus. There's a fairly nice, uh, pleasant glow behind him in the contrast of the the blue and the white and, and, and the gray. But do you notice the disciples there on the bottom? they're not exactly looking comfortable. And it's not because of of the weird pose that, you know, Raphael painted them in either, where, you know, that would get uncomfortable after a while. It's the light. It's the light that, the brightness that has their faces like this and, and hands covering like this this is that time of year where the, the sun can be brighter, or at least feel brighter, than maybe, say, end of December. But if you have white snow on the ground, what are you doing a lot of? A lot of squinting, right? Uh, sunglasses, simply because the reflection, not just from the light coming from the sun, but the reflection coming off the snow is just so very intense and bright. But that's not it all. Of, that's not all of it either. It's not just the, the brightness of the light. It's the who behind the light. The who behind the light that very much reveals. The who behind the light, the person behind the voice that deep down into our metaphorical bones, we know he knows. We human beings know that God is fully aware. And the things that we we are so good 
so often. We human beings are, are really good at hiding. Sometimes we refer to it as a filter, which, which can be a good skill, right? <laughs> as a practical matter, it's just a good thing to have an ability to not have everything that pops into your head come out of your mouth. But it means we're also really, really good at hiding. Hiding the thoughts up here. Hiding the things going on in here that if other people really knew what we thought, if other people really knew what we thought of them, if other people really knew what we thought about the choices they were making or the things that they were doing, if people really knew what our opinion about this thing was or that thing was. And we're really good at hiding from one another. But in the end, a reason why the light of Christ, the light of the gospel can be uncomfortable for some is because deep down in our spiritual bones, we know he knows. We know he knows. When the disciples heard the voice of God on the mountain, Peter, James, and John, that, that inner group, that, 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 that inner circle of Jesus' closest companions. And when they heard the voice, just like their forebears before them when in the presence of Almighty God, they hit the deck. We see multiple examples of this. We could look back in, in Exodus and, and see the reaction of the Israelites when the glory of the Lord appears on the mountain. Uh, we're we're going to look here, though, very briefly at Isaiah, Isaiah 6. Isaiah has granted this incredible, wonderful, awesome vision of heaven. The angels are flying around. They're singing. They're praising God. And then Isaiah sees the Lord on the throne. And he cries out. After seeing the presence of Almighty God, he cries out, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He knows in front of whom he stands. He knows that he's in the presence of one who knows. And he knows that sinful man cannot stand in the presence of the glory of Almighty God. And it's absolutely terrifying to him. Absolutely terrifying. Woe is me, he cries out. And that in the end is why so many people go and hide. That in the end is why so many people go and hide in the dark, do their best to stay out of the light. Sometimes even as they claim to be in the light. John writes in his first epistle, one of the three who was on the mountain, one of the three who was in the presence of the glory of the Lord, one of the three who saw the face of Jesus shining and his clothes white as light, who heard the voices of Elijah and Moses, John writes, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. There's an inconsistency there. In, in recent weeks, we've asked ourselves through God's word, how are we doing? Are, are we living consistent lives of faith that line up with the confession we have as, as believers? 1 John 2, 9, an example that he gives of this about those who claim to walk in the darkness but do not have, the, or but hate their brother or sister. Those who claim to walk in the light yet hate a brother or sister, that's a problem. That's an inconsistency. Are we walking in the light and, 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 and sometimes, yes, but there's a reason why people avoid the light. Sometimes even Christians, because the light of God can be uncomfortable, because we know he knows. 
because we know he knows what's going on in here. We know he knows what's going on up here. And if the Lord out loud spat out even one of the things that we know he knows and everybody else heard, we know it could ruin us. And so we hide. And so we hide. We avoid the light of Christ. We avoid the light of Christ in, in terms of, of devotion and prayer. We avoid the light of Christ by avoiding church or people at church because it's uncomfortable. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. That verse is exactly why so many people hide. They don't want it exposed. They don't want others to know. And we want to do our best. If, if we can hide well enough, if we can stay far enough away from God or reminders about God in church, if we stay far enough away, then maybe we can pretend like the ostrich with his head in the sand. Maybe we can pretend that it's not there. John 3, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Isaiah cried out, Woe! Woe is me, I am ruined! And again, that's probably why a lot of people stay out of the light. Because they don't want to be ruined. But here's the thing. The light is exactly what we need. The things that people spend so much time running away from, hiding from, avoiding, is the thing, the exact very thing that we need. We need the light. We need to dwell in the light and we have to quit avoiding it. Because if we can allow ourselves to walk into the light, we're going to see this. God's gracious heart. Here's the sad irony. Those who spend so much time hiding in the dark and avoiding the light, who spend so much time avoiding God and any reminder of him because it's just too uncomfortable and too awkward, are also cutting themselves off from the very thing that could bring them the greatest comfort, peace, and yes, dare I say, even joy. We need the light. And it's in the light that we see the love and grace and mercy of God for us. It's in the light that we see something absolutely and completely mind-bogglingly mind incredible. We see a God who knows exactly what's going on in us, who knows exactly the thoughts in our heads and the things of our heart, and yet he is still determined to love, forgive, and dwell with us. And we get just a little bit of that gracious God, a little bit of a taste of that grace of God, in the gentle way we see Jesus respond to his disciples' fear. They're terrified in the presence of God. The holy, righteous, mighty, almighty God. It's terrifying to them. But Jesus walks up to them, puts his hand on them, and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We know very clearly from God's word that God is holy and righteous and 
powerful and mighty. But we also know from the light of his word, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know how good and gracious and kind he is too. And that in the final analysis, what's back there doesn't change the reality of who God is for you. What's in here doesn't change the reality of what God has done for you. God loves, period. He loves you. He wants nothing more than to forgive and to have a relationship with you. He wants nothing more for you to, than for you to come into his light so that he can show you grace and mercy and love and tell you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. These words that we know so well from John 3.16. We know these words real well, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Gospel in a nutshell, great thing. But have you ever really thought about the follow-up verse 17? Again, so many people avoid the light because they're afraid that if they walk into the light, all God is going to do is yell at them and berate them and belittle them and condemn them. And God wants us to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that that's not actually what he wants to do. In fact, those who come into the light are going to know nothing but his grace and salvation. God says so, verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God did not send his Son into the world, so all Jesus would do is sit there, stand there, proclaim from the mountaintops how utterly terrible, awful, and unredeemable we are. That's not why God sent Jesus into the world. That's not why the Father sent his Son into the world, just to simply tell us, go to hell. No, he sent his son into the world to save, to redeem, to redeem us. He sent his son into the world to save. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, we can be confident that as we come into his light, we are going to know his forgiveness, mercy, and love. That is the gospel, period. Isaiah, so terrified of being in the presence of Almighty God, was reminded of that gospel. An angel using a really interesting image, a really interesting image that we could spend a whole lot of time talking about, I suppose. But the basic image was, is this. If you read verses 5 and 6, the angel goes and flies to the, the altar and there's a bunch of burning coals and he uses some tongs and he, and he grabs those coals and, and then he comes back with one of those coals and, and he touches Isaiah's tongue with it and he says, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is the power and punch of the gospel. The gospel doesn't pretend sin doesn't exist. The gospel doesn't come up with some sort of weird roundabout way of just trying to tell us just you're fine as you are and you're okay and there's no problems and, 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 and you're just good. It doesn't pretend. It's real. Yes, there are problems, there are sin, and, and that is why, again, some people try to hide in the dark. Because, But God, in his gospel, he confronts that sin. He looks our sin straight in the face, and he forgives. And in Christ, he atones. And then we move on. And we move forward. And we move forward wearing, in God's sight, the same white robe that the disciples saw Jesus wearing on the mountain. 
pure and holy, clean and full of light and life. And that's you in Christ. Standing in the light of the gospel, you are clean, pure and holy in the sight of God, shining with the light of the light of the world. And now you can face light with life without fear. And you no longer need to be afraid. Let's pray. Please stand. Lord God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Redeemer and Sanctifier, Creator, Sustainer, Light of the World, your light shines, and we ask today that you would help us to dwell in that light, help us to walk as children of the light. Help us to live in that light consistently and well. But may that light also be a, a source of comfort and reassurance for us. May we always remember that in the light, as your children, we are forgiven, redeemed, dearly loved children who, washed in the blood of the Lamb, will have eternal light and life to look forward to with you in heaven. On this Transfiguration Day, we ask that your church would shine with a measure of your brightness, that as we go into this season of Lent, we would continue to shine again with that same light. We ask that your peace and mercy would fill our hearts, that it would drive away guilt and despair, fear and shame. And then walking in your light, in walking in your light, we may help others to see light and know life as well. Be with us, Lord Jesus, this week and always as we join in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we continue now on page 8 with the preface, page 8. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join the glorious song.
and our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord's table has been prepared. Please come forward in peace and joy. We continue now with the closing prayer and blessing. Please stand. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude our service with our final hymn, hymn 388. Hymn 388.
morning, everyone. A few things here before we uh, get going for the day. Um, one, um, just keep an eye on weather reports for Wednesday. Um, we will plan on having church. We will plan on having the National Wednesday dinner as scheduled. We will also keep an eye on the weather. Um, drive safe, be smart. Uh, absolute worst case scenario, we've already kind of sort of kicked around, at least informally, as if we need to move the meal the next week, we will. Um, but um, the plan right now is to do Ash Wednesday as scheduled, 4 and 6 30 with the meal in between. Um, also, um, a week ago, Saturday, uh, voters issued a call to uh, Pastor Tom um, Barthel to be the next pastor here. We did receive a, an acknowledgement letter from him um, fairly quickly, and uh, a couple of um, uh, people from church have already had a chance to talk with him. Uh, I'll read the letter here. It's printed for you in your service folder, too, if you're curious. Uh, dear spiritual leaders and members of Central Lutheran Church, I am writing to acknowledge the receipt of the divine call to serve as pastor at Central Lutheran. Thank you for extending the privilege of joining with you at Salt Rapids in serving and glorifying our Savior. I thank you, our gracious Lord. I thank our gracious Lord of the Church for the unity and fellowship we share. It is encouraging to see the work you carry out for the sake of the gospel. I remember finally the times I visited Petra while serving in your circuit nearly a decade ago. I recall the privilege of guest preaching in Petra in rotation with Pastor Daly. Your warm welcome and joy in the gospel was evident, and I rejoice to know that it continues. I pray for wisdom as I deliberate, and I welcome your insights. Thank you for your work to organize the call packet and clearly communicate all aspects of the call. I look forward to speaking with some of you soon. May you find blessing as, our, as you meditate on the work of Christ in this upcoming Lent season. May we all boldly confess him as our rock and confidently build our faith on him, your brother in Christ, Thomas Barthel. Um, per his invitation, feel free to email him. Give him a call. Um, if you want contact information um, beyond the, the address, physical address here, um, let me or Jeremy know, or, or use the link that went on the email this last week. Um, that will take you to where you can find his, his phone number and, and email and all that stuff. Um, also, lastly, um, it wasn't um, in the bulletin, I forgot to mention it last sat on Sunday, but per the schedule that went out at the beginning of the year, um, technically today we do not have Sunday School Week off because of President's Day weekend. Um, so, um, thank you for being here, and uh, if anybody has any questions uh, about that or anything else, we'll just start Sunday School next week again like normal. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to catch me in the back of church. We will be safe, and Lord willing, we'll see you again very soon.